We're reading from Esther chapter 7, verses 1 through 6, and 9 through 10, and chapters 9, 20 through 22. So the king and Haman went to Queen Esther's banquet, and as they were drinking wine on the second day, the king again asked, Queen Esther, what is your petition? It will be given you. What is your request? Even up to half the kingdom, it will be granted. Then Queen Esther answered, If I have found favor with you, your majesty, and if it pleases you, grant me my life. This is my petition. And spare my people. This is my request. For I and my people have, sold, have been sold to be destroyed, killed, and annihilated. If we had barely been sold as male and female slaves, I would have kept quiet, because no such distress would justify disturbing the king. King Xerxes asked Queen Esther, who is he? Where is he? The man who has dared to do such a thing. Esther said, an adversary, an enemy, the vile Haman. Then Haman was terrified before the king and queen. Then Hermana, one of the eunuchs attending the king, said, A pole reaching to the height of 50 cubits stands by Haman's house. He had it set up for Mordecai, who spoke up to the, help the king. The king said, Impel him on it. So they impelled Haman, and he sent letters to all of the Jews throughout the provinces of King Xerxes, near and far, to have them celebrate annually the 14th and 15th days of the month of Adar as the time when the Jews got relief from their enemies. And as the month went, when their sorrow was turned into joy and their mourning into a day of celebration, he wrote them to observe the days as days of feasting and joy and giving presents of food to one another and gifts to the poor. Hashtag blessed day. It is uh, great to be here. We are, are glad to be here to celebrate with you. Uh, so Lewis at the Sacramento Gay Men's Chorus at Central, uh, whenever that was. I was surprised you weren't singing with it, but he was enjoying it. And uh, we wish Pastor Terry good times. Will you join with me in prayer? God, we hear this ancient story. Allow it to touch our spirits. Allow it to speak to us on our journey. So that it will become for each of us your word of life. In these next few moments, regardless of words spoken, may your word of life come to each of us. So your word will guide our journey. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. I alluded as, I didn't allude, I said it clearly as we were beginning our time together today, it's no secret, that the world in which we are living right now seems incredibly complex and convoluted. Some of our friends in the Middle East used to be our enemies, and some of our enemies in the Middle East used to be our friends. Syria and Turkey and Russia are working out and squabbling over some sort of demilitarized zone to ease the crisis there. Politicians of every persuasion in our country are stumbling over themselves to explain their solution to the immigration issue. So far, it ain't working well. Many, many live in fear of their neighbor. Time and again, we build walls between those in our community whose religion is different than ours, whose uh, politics is different than ours, whose language is different than ours. We build a wall separating those who married a spouse we believe they should not have married. Oh, it's so much easier to build barriers than to build bridges. It's so much easier to consolidate and to control than to be in conversation. The condition of our world and our response to it was floating through my mind as I pondered the scriptures that Pastor Terry and you all together have chosen as the focus for this morning. The story of Esther. 
I have very seldom preached on Esther's story. And uh, the day when Pastor Terry and I, the day that somebody stole her purse, she and I were to have coffee at Starbucks and talk about this morning. And we're sitting there talking, and this wacko friend of ours, I could tell she wasn't really focused. And I said, what's happening? She says, well, somebody just walked into my office and stole my purse, and we were all there. A bunch of us were there. And I said, why are you talking to me? Get out of here. Go, go deal with that. You don't have to. So she, she dumped me, didn't even buy my coffee. <laughs> so, yeah, that's true. <laughs> anyway, I did tell her that day that uh, I couldn't remember preaching on Esther's story, that it, that it might have been some 30 years ago when I was serving the church in Sutter Creek when I preached a series of sermons on women in the Old Testament. I, uh, that was a guess. But this story is a story full of political intrigue, every bit as intriguing as Mueller and Manafort and Kavanaugh and the Judiciary <laughs> Committee and Rosenstein and Trump. Mm. It's all in the Bible. See it worse for last. Mm. Yeah, well, <laughs> besides all this intrigue, it is a story which, as we saw right at the end, that explains an ancient and still practiced Jewish holiday. So let's have some fun for a moment with polit political intrigue and interesting parties. Let's see what the Word of God might offer. But before we get to this morning's reading, a bit of history. The book of Esther is indeed a very interesting book. The book had a very difficult time becoming a part of either the Jewish or the Christian canon. There could be a number of reasons. It, it lacks many religious elements. There are no prayers. There are no sacrifices. There's no mention of Jerusalem or the temple. Neither Mordecai or Esther acknowledge the Jewish law. Esther is married to a Gentile, eats non-kosher food, seems well assimilated into the Gentile world. And in all the story of Esther, in all of the story of Esther, God is never mentioned. But as we will see in the telling of this story, whether God is mentioned or not, God's providence is evident as God works through the actions of people, works through events of the day. And so to Esther's story. Many translations of this morning's scripture begin with the reading, so. And whatever translation you read, read from said, so. The king and Haman went in to feast with Queen Esther. What follows is based on what has come before. Sort of like, sort of like this. Uh, one day this week, Jackie and I went to Apple Hill. You know what's at Apple Hill? Apples. Apples. Yeah. But they make lots of really good stuff with apples. Pie. Yeah. Pie. The fritter. Fritters. So let me just say, Jackie and I were at Apple Hill enjoy, and we enjoyed the day immensely. So, on Tuesday, when I have to go away in a Weight Watchers, uh -oh. it won't be a good day. And you all know, or I'm assuming you know, that uh, Orchard Supply is shutting down, which really makes me mad. It was the best of all. But you know, they're having a tremendous closing sale. So I've been there a lot. So, in the not too distant future, a bunch of what I bought will be being sold at our garage sale. Yes, so always means that something has happened before. So, before we get to today's part of this intriguing story, we go back to see what got us to the point, this point in this morning's reading. To get to the so of our reading, 
we begin at the very, very beginning. Vashti was the queen married to King, in, in your translation, Xerxes, which is easier than the name I have here, so I'm going to use Xerxes, which was from another translation. The king was hosting a party for all of the male leaders in the kingdom. At the same time, Queen Vashti was hosting all the women at a banquet which was happening just down the hall in the castle. The king ordered Queen Vashti to join the guys at the banquet. Queen Vashti refused. The king was furious. No one, not even the queen, says no to the king. He gathered his closest advisors together, whose names are so complicated, I'm just saying he gathered his advisors, seeking their advice. There was great concern by all these men that Queen Vashti's defiance would serve as an example to the other wives in the kingdom, and that they, like the queen, would defy their husbands, would not listen to their demands. Therefore, she would have to go. So Queen Vashti was vanished from the castle. Her role as queen ended. Now, with Vashti banished, a new queen was needed. A, a, a search committee was formed. Virgins from throughout the land were brought to the harem in Susa, where the king's eunuch was in charge of all the women in the king's hair. There, there are so many straight lines in the story that we'll keep moving. Now Esther was one of the women brought to the harem. She was the adopted daughter of Mordecai, her uncle, who was a high official in the king's court. Now although it was known that Mordecai was a Jew, both his relationship with Esther and the fact that she was also Jewish were kept secret. Well, when the king, keeping our story PG-13, shall we say, met Esther, kings get what kings want, you know, he was impressed by her beauty and pronounced that she would be the new queen. Well, now Mordecai, her uncle and guardian, accompanied her all along the way in this journey. And along the way, earlier, before she had arrived on scene, he had foiled the plot to assassinate the king. The king, of course, appreciated this very much. And Mordecai began to move up the ladder of power and influence among the king's advisors. And as Mordecai's power and influence increased, he took away some of the power and influence of Haman, who was a Persian nobleman who served uh, as the king's chief of staff, if you will. When Mordecai refused to bow to Haman, Haman decided then and there to get rid of not only of Mordecai, who was a Jew, but of all the Jews. He plotted a plan for their murder. Mordecai learned of the plot and informed the queen. Now they both wanted to save their people, but to do this, they somehow had to get the king to issue a proclamation to save the Jews. This was not an easy task. To, to approach the king without being invited was an invitation to be killed, even for the queen. Mordecai and Esther weighed the possibilities and consequences. Mordecai said to the queen as she pondered and wavered, as she wavered and pondered, you've heard this before. Do not think that in the king's palace you will escape any more than the other Jews. For if you keep silence at such a time as this, relief and deliverance will rise for the Jews from another quarter, but you and your father's family will perish. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. The queen is persuaded by Mordecai's speech. Oh, it's in the timing. All being at the right place at the right time. Or, 
or is it being devoted to a cause and to a people? Well, they had to develop a plan, and so Esther instructs Mordecai to order three days of fasting and prayer by all of the Jews in the city and says, even though it is against the law, I will go to the king, and if I perish, I perish. After three days of fasting and prayer, the queen hosts two banquets. You can imagine, or maybe we can't, there's lots of food and there's lots of wine. We've now reached the so of our reading. So it is that we've come to the second of the two banquets. And having been plied with lots of good food and lots of good wine, the king, as we heard, offers Esther anything she desires up to one half of his kingdom. She pleads for her life and the life of her people who are set to be killed by the government. The king is outraged, asked who is responsible for creating this plan. And when Haman is exposed as the one who organized this plot to kill all the Jews, Esther gets all she has requested and more. As Haman is confronted and then hanged for his plan, the very instrument of death he had created for Mordecai. Queen Esther's willingness to risk all she had even her life for what was right and just has set her people free. Her faith has redeemed her people by risking her life. Queen Esther has saved not only her life, not only Mordecai's life, but the life of her people who are being held in bondage. There's just a bit more to our reading. As I mentioned when we began, this is a story of political intrigue, yes, and the explanation of a fun Jewish holiday. Yes, all the political intrigue has gotten Esther into the king's chamber and Mordecai into a more powerful political position. Naaman the villain has been hung on the gallows that he built for Mordecai and the Jewish people have been saved from genocide. But what of this Jewish holiday? This Jewish holiday is known as the Feast of Purim. Biblical instructions a bit later in the book, which, which we heard just a bit of, um, there is more. Provide guidelines for the celebration of Purim. Purim is to be celebrated on the 14th and 15th day of Adar on the Hebrew calendar, which was, is February. This party commemorates the days of deliverance for the Jewish people with a time of feasting and rejoicing. There's some specific components to this feasting and rejoicing. There's to be an exchange of food and drink. There's always food and drink. It seems like fun times. Donations are to be made to charity for the poor. There's a celebratory meal. And the story of Esther is read. This is, this is a great tradition. I've done it with uh, children at children's time. Read the story, or at least part of it, any time the name of Mordecai or Esther are read, the audience cheers. And any time Naaman's name is read, the audience boos. Great fun. Additional prayers may be offered for the community. During this wild celebration of deliverance, there might also be much more drinking of wine and wearing of costumes. It's a fun and boisterous party. And there we have it. Esther's story. A story of political intrigue to match anything going on in our nation at the moment and the rules for a wild party to celebrate Esther saving her people from Naaman's murderous plot. Now as you're well aware, as, um, as I mentioned, Pastor Terry and I met and she gave me the scripture readings for this, this series you're in the middle of the ABCs. You work with the lectionary, which you and those Methodists up the street and a bunch of other folks use to plan worship. And in these readings in the last few weeks, we've been reminded of our need to be about the work of justice and peace, the need to welcome all of God's children 
into the circle of God's love, have been reminded that of our commitment to offer a word of hope in a world often trapped in despair, trapped in the isms of bigotry and sexism and poverty and racism and isms of every kind. Yes, these scriptures remind us of the basic ABCs and more. I just couldn't fit the story of Esther in with the reading from Mark into one sermon. But I do believe that this morning's powerful story of Esther from the wisdom literature has much to teach us, reminds us that it goes deeper than just doing the very basics, doing the good we know we should do. I believe we also need to pause and ponder. To what are we called? Where have we been placed? Why have we been placed where we've been placed? What is our purpose in saying yes to God's call? To what are we devoted? Mordecai's statement to Esther when she was still wavering the decision as to save her people or not. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just such a time as this. <clears throat> This question becomes his question to us. Have we been placed in the place we are for such a time as whatever is touching our heart? Do we have the courage of Esther to say yes and risk everything to do what is right and just? If I perish, then I perish. The answers to this question, this pondering, are different for each of us. The risks are greater for some than for others. Some are clear about their call in the place they find themselves. Others still seek the guidance of God's Spirit about where God might be leading them. With this we reach our own, so what is next? We ponder. We ponder our time, our place, ponder God's call to us in this time and in this place. Ponder what is God calling us to? What are we to risk? Ponder what might be next steps. Yes, Mordecai asks even us. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for a time such as this. Can we say with Queen Esther, I will go to the king, though it is against the law, and if I perish, I perish. Can we say with Queen Esther to the death-creating powers of our world, we will seek life no matter the cost? Can we say with Queen Esther to the wall-creating leaders of our world, we will seek bridges, not barriers, no matter the risk? Can we say with Queen Esther to the hate perpetrators of our world, we will live love in all we do, no matter the price we pay? Hear Mordecai's question one more time. Who knows? Perhaps you have come to royal dignity for just a time as this. That question, our answer, both well worth pondering. Amen. I give all my heart to you. I lay down my life.